We're gonna jump into the first question. By the way, some of you guys are like, where are these questions coming from? You guys who follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, thank you. Your questions are getting answered first. Then, if anyone wants has a question, type it into the chat here on YouTube. I will answer it within the time limit that we have. So, here we go. First question up, is Amazon FBA still going strong? Yes, Amazon did $111 billion in the month of September. It is insane how much the company has continued to expand. So yes, it is. Now, here's just an interesting thought. According to multiple resources, there are approximately 20,000 e-commerce stores in the world. That's multiple sources. No one knows the exact number. Half of the sales for all those e-commerce stores happen through Amazon. I just checked a few days ago. I went to the United, United States Census Bureau. If you go there, you can go there right now and look. In the last quarter, if you just take all the retail sales in the U.S., now that includes both brick and mortar as well as online, only 13.3% of them are online. Most people I ask what percentage of retail sales in the U.S. are online, they're going to say like 50%, 80%, 70%. No, it's 13.3% if you look at the last quarter. What does that tell me? With as fast as Amazon is growing and the fact that they have a stable infrastructure, aka the internet, that is no longer in the dot-com boom stage, which caused a huge crash, the dot-com boom, as well as the 2006 to 2008 uh, real estate, but that was also based on horrible lending activities, which is also an unstable infrastructure. Because the internet has been around, the, the growth for Amazon is steady, and that's the kind of growth you want to look for. You don't want to just jump on the latest, newest thing because it's exciting. Everyone, let's go. And then, boom, it explodes. Amazon's been around since 1994. And they weathered the dot bomb, the dot, uh, dot com crash. They weathered the real estate crash in 2006 to 2008. And they're still here. That tells me something. So to answer the question, yes, Amazon FBA is still strong. Next question. What other channels should we invest in in addition to Amazon? The first one I will go to is Walmart and eBay. Now, Walmart is going to still be more general goods. If you're trying to private label a product, Amazon continues to be the best place to launch that and start your brand and then expand into your own e-commerce website. And I recommend Shopify still, and I've been recommending that for the last four years. Shopify does the very best job, not to mention that they have some of their own fulfillment centers, which they have rolled out as a beta test. It's not available to everyone yet for fulfilling products. However, if you have a very standard, common, basic product, like a house cleaning product, a broom, a couch, a lamp, basic products. A lot of people go to Walmart to find those kind of products. Right now, the majority of Walmart uh, e-commerce stores that I'm aware of are drop ship. Is there an opportunity to build a brand on Walmart? Yes. Does it have the same pull as Amazon? No. But I would highly recommend you at least get started or open an account there. Additionally, there's something called Target Plus. Target just recently came out with an opportunity where you can actually sell online in Target. And Costco is also coming out with a platform where you can sell on Costco. Now, why don't we get excited about these other platforms where Amazon's made me the majority of my income, the majority of my revenue, and allowed me to leave the richest company in the world? Why am I excited about these other platforms? Because of the free market. That's why I love the free market. That's why I believe in freedom. When the market is free, and places like Costco and Target, even Shopify with fulfillment centers, and of course, good old Walmart, when they compete against Amazon, that forces Amazon to do a better job for you. Because let's all be honest, they don't do a great job taking care of their sellers. That is probably the biggest frustration I have with Amazon is they still do not give the priority to sellers that they should. And it's something we have to continue to fight. Has it gotten better over the years? Absolutely but they have a long way to go. May Walmart and Target Plus and Costco raise the competition and cause Amazon to be motivated to get back into gear. All right, next question. How do you calculate your profit margins in order to be 33%? When doing arbitrage, I always recommend the thirds number. In other words, if you take all the revenue, let's just say you, you sold a product and it for $99. 33 of the dollars went to Amazon fees. 33 of the dollars went to the supplier, could be Walmart, wherever you did the arbitrage, and 33 goes into your pocket. 
That is the rule of thirds for arbitrage. I do not recommend 33% margin for private label brand building, which is our primary focus. How do you calculate it? It's very simple. You take your profit and you divide it by your revenue and you multiply that by 100. You move the decimal two places over to the right, which would be that way for you. That is your profit margin. That's it. How do you know what it's going to cost? Well, there's this thing called the Amazon Revenue Calculator. If you just Google it right now, you can find it. And from there, you can type in the expected revenue that you expect to make on that product. But what about the size and the weight, Seth? Because the Amazon FBA fees are based on size and weight. Very good point. It will give you the option to pull up an ASIN. That's the number that identifies your product in Amazon's catalog. You drop it into the box, a similar product of the size and weight as close to the one as you want to sell as possible on that page. And now you can just walk through and put in, well, what are my costs going to be? Well, Alibaba, finding a supplier on Alibaba gives you a very good estimate of what those costs would be once they send you a PI, which stands for a pro forma invoice. You can also calculate the potential shipping cost by going to Freitos, F-R-E-I-G-H-T-O-S.com. Take those numbers, drop them into the revenue calculator, put in your goal price. Know what your price range is. If you studied the competition on Amazon, you will know the number. And that will give you not only your profit, let's just say you're going to make $40 off a $100 sale, but it will give you your profit margin, which in that case would be 40%. However, keep in mind, this does not account for PPC, which stands for pay-per-click, which is advertising cost for selling on Amazon. So you must account for that as well. At first, it's going to be much more expensive. You might not even be profitable yet. It might take a few weeks. And as you optimize your listing, your PPC costs go down your profits go up. So you might end up with a 30% profit after PPC, which is very reasonable. But I always recommend you start with a minimum, as much as possible, 40% profit margin. Now, someone's going to say, wait a minute, Seth. I just, I found this product and this thing's going to make me $200 per sale at only 30% margin. You make a fair point. There are products out there, the higher cost products, where you might only have a margin of $30. But if you're making $200 per sale, I mean, you have to sell 10 of those a day to make a really nice passive income stream. What really matters at the end of the day of how, is how much money you're gonna make. As a general rule, the lower the cost of the product that you sell on Amazon, the higher your profit margins need to be. Why is that? Well, nothing against Chinese. We have friends in China, we have staff, but... They do a lot of shady stuff, the Chinese Amazon sellers. It's been a problem for Amazon for a long time. If you want to avoid that saturated competition, then stop selling products that sell for under $30. Now, there's nothing magical about $30. I'm not going to come after you like, hey, you sold it for $29. How dare you? No, the point is it's a general guideline, okay? In other words, the higher the product sells for an Amazon, let's just say it sells for $80, $100, $120 the more room you have to have a lower profit margin because each sale gives you so much income. In other words, I'm more interested in profit, what I actually make in this case, than I am profit margin. But as a safety rule, 40% margin is a goal. Again, that is not gospel. That is not Bible. That is a recommendation based on over 50 years selling an Amazon between myself and all of our other Amazon sellers within the Just One Dime network. Great question, by the way, and that was a long answer. Let's go to the next question and keep the question up until we move to the next question, guys. Is there any best season of the year to start selling? Yes, and it's spelled with three letters, N-O-W. Now, right now is the best time to sell. <laughs> Look, I'm being a little facetious, but I need to tell you something. If you are waiting for the perfect opportunity, forget it. It'll never come. In my short 43 years of existence on planet Earth, I will be 44 the day after Christmas this coming December. There is nothing in my life that I have been proud of that I did. And I look back and said, huh, I waited for the perfect moment. Guess what? It'll never come. When I found the woman who would be my wife someday, it was not the perfect moment. When I decided to start building a business while working sometimes 10 to 12 hour days for Apple and also starting to drive for Uber and Lyft till three to four in the morning on the weekends here in Austin, Texas, 
that was definitely not the perfect time. Now, I know I'm being facetious, but there's a point here. The best time is now. If you're waiting, my simple question is, what would your 80-year-old self say, assuming you're younger than 80 years old? What would your future self say? Would they be happy you waited another year or two? Why don't, act, why don't you act now? Our world has become so full of fear and defensiveness and debates and arguments and all this crap going on. And people are forgetting, pour your energy into building a life that gives you freedom to do the things you love with the people you love. Now, I will answer your question uh, from an economical point of view now. <laughs> December, from right after Thanksgiving until December the 23rd is going to be your highest selling time on Amazon in the year. If you miss that window, it's okay. If you're looking for a quick buck, yeah, you're going to lose sleep over that. If you're in this for the long term to build something huge, it's okay. Don't lose sleep over it. But that is when you will make the most money. Now, obviously, selling the other months of the year, you're going to make a lot more money than that one little window. But I would just start now. Like, what are we waiting for? In fact, the only thing I would caution you against is if you're going to sell a seasonal product, make sure you launch it at least one month before the season hits. As a general rule, sales slow down in January. That's like the season of returns. They start to pick up in March. When you get to Mother's Day, Father's Day, Valentine's Day in February, that's when they also pick up based on the kind of product. And then in the summer months, it's going to be more summer products. And as the winter comes going into September, it's more school products. There's an ebb and flow. So again, the answer is the same. Start now. All right, next question. Great question, by the way. Is it better in the first year to take home only 5% of the profit and invest in the business with the other 95%? What should we do with our money, especially in the beginning? Jeffrey, great question. Here is the answer, my friend. Reinvest all of it as long as you can until you're ready to say goodbye to your nine to five. That's exactly what I did. I didn't take any money home for myself other than paying off debt. That was it. Other than debts. In fact, I used my car to drive for Uber and Lyft to pay off my car debt. Take all the money, put it back into your business so that your business can work for you. It's like raising a child. Would you expect a one-year-old to do very much for you? Of course not. They need help. You know, they can't just go out and find food. They can't buy a car. They can't take care of the house maybe a little, uh, probably not at one years old. They can't clean the house. They probably make it a mess. You wait until they're older and then they start to bless you back. When your business is born, it is like a fragile little newborn baby. You need to take care of it so that someday it'll take care of you. Just like an apple tree, just like this logo on my arm. This logo is for a reason, guys. It represents life. You start with the seed and that grows. And over time, someday that fruit tree blesses you back which means for a while you're investing in it. Now, if you're in a situation where you need to lean on your business for your livelihood and you need that 5%, there's no harm in doing that. But look at it this way. For every dollar you reinvest today, it's going to be exponentially more than a $1 reinvestment a year from now. In other words, a dollar today invested well can easily be 10 years, 365 days from now. So putting it in now actually makes you make a lot more money than if you hold back on that dollar and reinvest it a year from now, you delayed the exponential growth. Great question. All right, gentlemen, next question. Great question. I love this one. What are the causes for congestion at the U.S. ports? So I'm going to give you a very simple answer, and then I'm going to give you more in-depth answer. What has happened with COVID, the pandemic, all of that? has had a huge ripple effect in all industries. Without getting too much into politi poli politics, it's probably a good name for it, politics, I've never believed in the US printing money. I think it is stupid. Just being honest, I think it's a crazy decision. The reason you're seeing the rise of prices in food right now goes back to printing money. Printing money causes inflation. It causes your, you know, receiving $10,000 today is not the same as it was 10 years ago, or even six months ago, it actually has less value. As a result of the whole pandemic and COVID and certain, like for example, I'll just use a specific example, California, they have multiple ports. They're one of the states that shut down a lot. Texas, Florida stayed open. 
You look at the economy in California, you see what's going on there. It's terrible right now. People in droves are leaving that state. Because those ports were shut down, the ships couldn't bring the products into port. So they're literally sitting there on the water waiting. Some were rerouted. Now, what are they going to do? Go all the way around South America, come up the other side? Like it became a massive issue. And then we have now have a shortage of shipping containers. Just to give you perspective, if you paid for a shipping container just one year ago, it might cost you, and I'm talking about a full 40 foot container, it might cost you $6,000. Today, easily $25,000. Now, to be fair, no one could have seen this coming. No one could have said, oh yeah, this is going to cause this and this and this. I mean, this is why when you go to rent a car today, the rentals, like you literally, you have to pay more, not only for the rental car, but they sold off a bunch of their inventory so they could survive during the pandemic. In other words, they have fewer cars now. Therefore, they're in higher demand. Therefore, they cost you more when you want to rent them. See how that ripple effect happens? So it's a, a bunch of different things. The good news is you're not alone. Everyone's experiencing this, not just all Amazon sellers in the US, but around the world. Everyone is. Because Amazon provides an opportunity to buy in, or to buy products and sell them on Amazon like no other platform I've seen, and because Amazon is growing, even though this horrible thing's happening over here with congestion, yes, prices have gotten higher for shipping. Yes, it's delayed things a lot, but Amazon continues to grow. So it almost is counteracting that. During the pandemic, while shipping, especially post-pandemic, while shipping became worse and logistics became a bigger challenge, Amazon has continued to expand, which helps to counterbalance this increased cost over here on this side. Now, here's what happens. A lot of Amazon sellers, they just give up. Like, oh, it's too much. I can't do it. It's too expensive. I can't do it. And my simple question to them would be, are you still buying on Amazon? Yeah. You know you're making people rich every time you buy something on Amazon. Like people are going to keep buying stuff. People need toilet paper. People like Seth, they need black tea. People are going to buy desks and chairs and lamps. That's not going to stop. So the question is, oh, yeah, it's all a lost case because of what happened. No, the question is, are you going to be the few who wins and makes money? Or are you going to be the person that says, yeah, forget it. I'm not going to do this. It's too much. The cool thing is all your competitors are dealing with the exact same challenge. But the people who decide and choose to endure are those who are going to succeed. Great question. Next question coming up. Is it better to pivot to a different manufacturing location or stay the course through the current supply chain challenge? I can't answer that question, Karen, directly because it completely depends on so many factors, but I can give you a couple tips and hopeful wisdom that will help you. Have you signed a contract with your manufacturer? It's the first question. Because if you have, now you have to ask, can you get out of that contract legally? Have you paid 30% down so that they will manufacture the goods? If you have, was a product inspection conducted to make sure the goods are ready to go before being shipped to Amazon's fulfillment center? Are you using AGL? If you don't know what AGL is, you need to know, guys. Amazon Global Logistics. This has been out for over a year. Probably over 90% of Amazon sellers don't even know it exists. Amazon Global Logistics can reduce your shipping costs drastically. Notice I said can. It's going to depend on multiple factors, like whether or not you're doing DDP, um, FOB, et cetera. Those are just inco terms for how something is shipped. Amazon Global Logistics has reduced, in our experience, in not all cases but many, the cost 20 to 30% what it would normally cost. So I'm talking about this good is manufactured in China, and now we ship it to Amazon's fulfillment center. So I would first look at those things. The second thing is when you talk about changing manufacturers, understand logistics, 99% of the time has nothing to do with the manufacturer. Even though you might say, hey, manufacturer, I'm going to pay you $1,200 to ship my products. They're not actually shipping it. They're sort of acting as what you would call a freight forwarder. They're working with a company who is the carrier who ships the products physically on that ship or through Air Express or air freight. So it's really not the manufacturer's fault. Now, in China right now, there are reduced working hours. They've reduced working hours to save energy and these other laws going on. So you are going to find some manufacturers are going to produce your products, 
a hell of a lot slower than others. And it's going to vary based on the industry. Because in China, the entire east side, that's where all the big cities are, like Shanghai, like Guangdong. And that's where you have your different manufacturers. And those manufacturers tend to cluster based on province. Each province has its own laws. So you might be sourcing you know, clothing. And Bobby McGee, because you guys are going to meet him someday, he's sourcing pet supplies. And the, the rules for those provinces are different because pet supplies tend to be in one province and clothing tends to be in another province. See what I mean? So there's a lot of factors. So to answer the question, I, I can't answer your question directly, but hopefully that helped to give you perspective. I will say this. I never met a person who didn't succeed who didn't give up. Never. All right, next question. Let's see it. Oh, by the way, guys, I have not seen any of these questions in advance. Staff wouldn't let me see them. They like to see me on the hot seat. They get this evil pleasure seeing me up here, but I enjoy it, so it's cool. <laughs> so stop me already. <laughs> How can you protect your ideas and find suppliers in the US or other countries with the exception of China? <laughs> with the exception of China. All right, got you. Couple things. So if you're gonna remove China out of the picture, then you're left with the US and all other countries. The most basic form of protection is going to start with a copyright. That would include photos, copy, anything that goes on your listing, which as you know is perceived value. By the way, guys, if you want like 10,000 times more than this and you want like everything, go here, jod.com slash freedom, jod.com slash freedom, check it out. But I'll answer your question. Copyright is the most basic protection. The second level of protection is a trademark. That would be for a word or a mark or a slogan. I'm loving it. That would be a slogan. The M, that would be a mark, such as like a logo. And McDonald's would be a word, a word mark. So a trademark can protect your brand. When your brand is established, it makes it more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult for others to sell your product. They pretty much are gonna have to prove that they are retail arbitragers and not just manufacturing the same product and selling it under your listing. The third level is going to be getting protection on the product itself. So the first we talked about the copy, then we talked about the slogan or the word mark or the logo. Now we're talking about a patent. And even though there's three kinds, there's only really two that are relevant to most people. There's a plant patent, but we won't talk about that. But you have a utility patent and you have a design patent. Utility patents last for 20 years, design patents, I think it's 10, I forget, don't quote me on that. You can Google it and correct me if you want in the chat. And that actually protects your product. A utility patent protects the function of it. Design would be like the shape of this handle. Design are less protectable than utility, but they're also easier to get. So those are your three levels of protection. The most important protection you can get that most people don't even talk about is brand value. Here's how it works. Let's just say you wanted to buy Nike shoes and someone on Craigslist is offering Nike shoes. So you're like, oh, I'll buy these. And you show up and you meet this person, you know, at some third party restaurant to be safe and they hand you the shoes and you open the box and you look at it and you go, uh-uh, that's not Nike. Why would you be so pissed? Because you know that Nike stands behind their brand. You now become an advocate for Nike and you get upset and you might even contact Nike. You might even post on social media, don't buy from this person on Craigslist because they're selling an inferior product. See what just happened? You're a customer and you're protecting the brand. That's the level of brand value you want to build as an Amazon seller and that is your greatest protection. If you just look at your product as a physical thing to make money, you will never make the money you want to make. You are building an experience. You are building an entire feeling, an emotion, an atmosphere around the products that you sell. That's why we teach an Amazon FBA mastery, not just how to buy and sell products, but how to build a brand that people will battle for to protect you from. And that is going to be your greatest protection. Now, one more part B to your question. I'm assuming you're thinking, what if the supplier starts to sell it as well? Sign an NNN agreement, which means basically three things. They cannot sell your product to other sellers. If you have a mold, they cannot use your mold to produce the product for other people. And third, they cannot sell the product themselves. An NDA is not sufficient. An NDA 
protects ideas. That's fine. You need an NNN agreement. Great question, by the way. Next question. All right. How crucial new lead times are, new shipping norms, quarter four rush versus January Chinese. Excellent question, Kimio. It depends on the product. The fastest way to find out your lead time is go to your top competitors, find out how many times they're selling per day. Most software tools are going to show you that number. It's not hard to find out. Or find out how many times in a month and divide it by 30. There you go. Let's just say it's 10 times a day. Now, assuming you're going to be one of the top organic ranking listings on Amazon, assume you're going to sell 10 times a day. Well, if you're going to do that over a month, that's 300 units. So you know 300 units will last you a full month. Let's say it takes the manufacturer 30 days to, pro to produce the product. Now you got 60 days. Let's say shipping costs 30 days. That's the stretch, but let's just assume. Now you have it 90 days. So you know you need to put in that second order, that, that batch for your next order, 90 days before you need it. See where I'm going? So what you do is you start with the facts and you work backwards. That's your strategy. Start with the numbers. Where do I find these numbers? You go to your top competitors. Now, are they going to be exact? Of course not. In fact, I would add on 15 days just to be safe, just for lead time. Even then, it's not a guarantee. Your manufacturer could take two months longer than expected. Things beyond their control and you just, you literally have to wait. The Chinese New Year is coming. You're right. In early February, I believe it starts late January this year, early February. That's like a two to three week period where you everyone goes home. Everyone in China goes home and they're celebrating the new year. And us Amazon servers like, come on, guys, I need my product. Come back. Like, please get back to the factory. So you want to order, make those orders very, very soon if you don't want to have that delay. But again, I want to say this as well. If you get frantic over it, if you lose sleep over it, if you start getting that feeling of anxiety, you need to stop for a minute. I promise you, this is the smallest of problems you'll deal with in running a business. You'll run into a lot more problems. Let's keep it real, okay? Building a business is hard. I just would rather build a business and be wealthy than not build a business and not be as wealthy. I'm not saying you have to build a business to be wealthy. That's not my point. You will run into other problems like competitors, like people selling on your listing, like people undercutting you. You might even hire some staff who end up betraying you. It's a horrible feeling. I've been through these things so many times. It's a part of building a business and a part of your own growth as well. Just don't let that urgency throw you off of your long-term gain. I'll just give you a quick example. I had such a great meeting with our real estate manager last night. Over an hour, we were planning out real estate for the future. Oh, by the way, a bunch of you guys said, Seth, will you please post the interview you did with Robert Kiyosaki? The interview happened. It happened. But I'm not posting it. And I will tell you why. And I don't want you guys to think that was some marketing stunt. I literally interviewed him. Okay, I'll show you video like B-roll. <laughs> I interviewed him, right, EJ? He's like nodding his head. He was there. Um, there's a reason I'm not posting it. And, it. and it reflects a lot of my values. And I'm excited to share that with you guys. And some people are going to be all pissed off, but oh well. I will share that soon on Instagram. If you haven't followed us, then you need to follow Seth Kinney. Oh, I lost my train of thought. What was the question again? Oh, yeah. So you're, oh, here we go. I was talking to my real estate manager. We are starting to plan out 10 years down the road. 10 years, where do I want to be with real estate? Then five years, then three years. Exact same thing you should be doing with your Amazon store and brand. You plan out and you work backwards. When you do it that way, you're not going to lose sleep over what happens over the next five months. You're going to think, okay, here are potential challenges. What's the best way to do this? But I have one warning for you guys. Whatever you do, do not rush your product to market at the risk of launching a product that you will regret because then the cost is so much more than beating Chinese New Year. Next question. Great question, by the way, guys. All right. Question, Yoav Priest, how are you, brother? I saw one opinion that if your ROI is not over 100%, it'll be very difficult to scale. I disagree, but I'll explain why in a moment. However, I have a product over $100 that has a profit margin between 33 and 43%, but ROI 40 to 67%. I love how you are into these numbers. By the way, guys, if you're wondering what's the difference between profit margin and ROI, profit margin, you take your profit, you divide it by your revenue, okay? So if you sell a product for $100 and $60 goes into paying the manufacturer and Amazon fees, that $40 left over is your profit. What's your margin? 40%. 40 divided by 100 is 40%. Okay. 
your ROI is a little different. You take your profit, also called cash flow, depending on the industry you're in, and you divide it by your investment. That's why profit margin can never be more than 100%, but ROI could be thousands. Make sense? Okay. For anyone to say that ROI, if it's not over 100%, then you can't scale your, or it's very difficult to scale your business. The reason I disagree with it is this. How much money is coming in per transaction? You don't want to just look at the percentage. You want to look at the amount. For example, if you're selling a product on Amazon for $300, let's just say your PPC ad cost is high. Let's say per keyword, it's $5. $5 per click for a $300 product. And let's be conservative. Let's say I make a $100 profit on every sale. That is a really nice discrepancy. That is a low PPC cost for a high selling product. See what I mean? So all of a sudden, ROI is not such a big deal because I'm like, wait a minute, I have so much room. I could go, I could have competitors going click, 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 click on my listing to cost me money and I'm still doing pretty good, okay? Now let's change the scenario. Let's say your product sells for $20, bad idea, but let's just say $20 and your PPC cost is five. <laughs> Do you know how painful it is when you have to get like 20 clicks on $5? That's $100 you have to spend to get a $20 sale. That's not scalable. In both situations, your ROI could have been the same based on your COGS and your profit. What changed PPC? Let me go back. Sorry, that's wrong. What changed how much you're selling it for? What made the difference? PPC. So yeah, don't let the comment that unless it's over 100% ROI, you can't, but that's not necessarily true. It, it depends on too many other factors. Great question. Let's go on to the next one. How to do product targeting like a pro and advanced method. To be able to walk you through this entirely right now is literally going to be impossible because there's so many different clicks you have to do, but I will give you a strategy and I'll explain to everyone what it means. Product targeting is where well, let me go back. What is regular advertising or PPC? If you're selling these cool tea mugs, for example, and I search blue tea mug and your sponsored listing comes up because I searched that keyword and it so happens that keywords in your PPC campaign as well as on your listing, that's called keyword targeting. In other words, listings show up based on the keywords that your customers or your shoppers searched. Product targeting is similar. I'm still going to search blue tea mug and a bunch of listings are going to show up that are blue tea mugs. And based on which listings show up, your sponsored ad shows up as well. So on the back end, instead of dropping keywords into campaign manager, you're dropping in ASINs. And ASIN is a little code after DB, after you have your amazon.com, blah, 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 DB forward slash, that code is your ASIN and then it's forward slash reference, et cetera. It's the code that represents your product on Amazon. You could literally take that ASIN and search it on Amazon and that listing will show up. Now for the strategy, now that everyone has a basic understanding of what product targeting is, which is not your typical keyword targeting. You need, first of all, to have differentiated your product. And it is more important that you differentiate it in one way well than three ways so-so. Once you've done that, you're going to find all the listings that have which whose weaknesses are your listings strength. In other words, if you're selling a golf club, the handle for grip is superior and all of theirs have complaints in the reviews about inferior grip handles. In other words, you're not going to put in the ASINs that actually have a strength where you have a strength, and hopefully there aren't too many of those, because if there are, then you did not do a good job of differentiating. You're going to put your product next to the listings whose weaknesses are your strengths. You are using the law of comparison. When I walk into a shopping place, which I hardly ever do, what do you even call it anymore? Okay, when I was in Miami last week, meeting with two, David Lopez and Daniela, two of our brand builders. Josiah and I went into uh, Fresh Mart, I think is what it was called. And I'm looking at all these tangerines. You know what I'm doing? I'm picking them up and I'm squeezing them. And I'm picking out the best ones. How? By comparison. That's exactly how the shoppers buy on Amazon. 
You want to put your listing next to ones that make you look like a badass. Now, don't make the same mistake when hiring teams and staff. Some a commitment that Josiah, my business partner, and I always made is we want to hire people who are better than us. A lot of people, because they feel insecure about who they are as people, they'll only hire people who boost up their ego. So in that situation, you want to do the opposite. But in this situation on Amazon, that is a strategy that works. Great question. Next question. When calculating the ROI, should that calculation include Amazon FBA fees or just landing cost of product to the warehouse? Yes, it needs to include both. Now, technically, your FBA fees, if you talk to any CPA, most of them are going to tell you those are operating costs, not COGS. It's completely legal and fine to count them as COGS on your profit and loss sheet. And the reason we do that is you need to know up front what I'm actually going to make so it's convenient to put it under COGS. So 1,000%, you need to calculate that. Here's what you don't calculate. Well, let me go back. When you're calculating profit margin, you're only looking at ongoing expenses like FBA fee, which is for Amazon shipping it, your referral fee for selling on Amazon's platform, your storage fee for storing in Amazon's fulfillment center, the cost of having the manufacturer build the product, the cost of having the carrier ship the product. You're going to include all those fees when looking at profit margin. But when you're looking at ROI, you're actually going to include all your upfront costs only, and then reinvestments, or not reinvestments, but additional contributions to your company. Let, let me give an example, okay? Let's say you put $100,000 into your Amazon business because you want this thing to grow huge. If that business pays for reorders of new products, sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. It depends on the market. It depends on a lot of factors. Let's say it does pay for itself, okay? You're going to include your cost of photography, which are called sunk costs, because usually you only do that once for a product. You should be getting multiple pictures so you can split test those images, right? That's a sunk cost. You would not include the cost of photography in profit margin, but you would include it in ROI. Why? Because I'm looking at it this way. Here's my $100,000. i am putting it in this bucket. Boom. I'm going to wait months and years to see what I can get out of it. What was the return on the investment I put in? That includes photography. That includes graphic design. That includes your logo. That includes the cost of getting your product inspected, even a factory inspection, okay? So now let's say by month three, I need to add an additional $5,000 for reorder because only half of it is covered by previous sales. Perfectly normal. So I'll add $5,000. Now I'm going to calculate my ROI based on $105,000, not $100,000. Next question. I'll go a little faster because I see a ton of questions coming in here, guys. And thanks. These are great questions, guys. These are fun. What's up, Erka? Can one business or company have two seller accounts under the same person? If yes, how? Great question. There are two main identities when you open an account on Amazon Seller Central. You have what's called your primary contact and you have what's called the identity that owns the Amazon business. Those are the two things, okay? They can be the same and they can be different. Both are perfectly fine. Let's first talk about the identity that owns the Amazon business. That could be a human or it could be an LLC. Now let's talk about the primary contact. The primary contact has to be a human because if you pick up your phone number and pick up the phone and call an LLC, they're probably not going to answer because that is not a human. Okay, so the primary contact is a human. Their identity is going to be either a passport, I mean their identity verification, or a driver license, for example, or whatever card you use, depending on what country you're in. Over here, the entity that owns the Amazon business could be the same as that person, or it could be an LLC owned by that person, or it could be an LLC owned by a different person. In other words, you don't have to have a connection between the primary contact and the owner of the Amazon store. Now, back to the question, now that I've explained the context, can one business or company have two seller accounts under the same person? Yes. Back in the day when I started, when I was a wee little lad, back it is like late uh, 2013, early 2014 when I started Amazon, you could not get a second account. And then later on, if you even tried, you, they would suspend your account. 
Then they said you have to fill out an application. Today, as of today, in a month from now, Amazon could change this because that's the one thing that never stops is Amazon changing. You can open a second account and you do not need Amazon's approval. The last time I did it, I still asked for their approval just to be safe. So yes, you can open a second account. Now, here's what I recommend. You got your two accounts, right? Instead of logging out of one and into the other and out of one, which is a pain, why not just log into one? Let's say this is account A, this is account B. Go into account A, invite the main email address for account B, okay? Because this can have to be a different email, by the way, because you have a primary email for every account. That email controls the account, has the power. Give account B, give it access to account A. Then in account A, accept it. And then when you're in account A, you can click a little drop down menu on the top right and you'll get a drop box of both accounts and you can switch between the both. And as long as you gave account B admin access to account A and vice versa, you can do everything from one login. Ta-da! Okay, next question. Seth, are your coaches really millionaires? Some of them are, some of them are not. But what is true of all of them is in fact, we just did this, it was like a month and a half ago. More than once a year, they have to send us a screenshot, not only of their Amazon sales, but a PL profit and loss report that shows us the money they're making. And they have to be growing their Amazon businesses over time to qualify as coaches. We've actually fired coaches who wouldn't provide that information. Next question. Follow it just one dime. That's the next question. <laughs> okay. All right. Guys, I'm going to take as many as I can before the team kicks me out of here. There's still only like 4,000 questions here. So I'm going to go fast, I promise, because I know I tend to give long answers. I'm just going to click it. It's going to show up here and boom. What's up, Eric? Good to see you, Jaffer. What's up, Kelly? How are you? Hello, Je Jeans Greens, Jeans Greens. I'm not going to forget that. I like that. All right, let's go, Andrew. Okay, here we go. This is Mr. Coley. How are you, brother? Good to see you. You are in the UK. I remember this guy. Hey, Seth, I made sales, but my profits are getting eaten up by Amazon PPC fees. What do you advise? I'm optimizing the keywords. I'm running phrase and exact match campaigns. One question. Why aren't you running broad match? Run broad match. Put in long tail keywords. By long tail, I mean at least three words or more. Put them in there. It will find you other keywords. Do not go for it. Let me slow down. It will find you keywords that may not be in your listing and in your campaign that you can later add. And then, and then you've opened up your market a little more. Then once they're working well, you move them over to exact match because you have more control over them. Do not put a short tail keyword in broad match or it's going to cost you an arm and a leg and a couple lungs. The other key here is when you're running your broad match and you have your phrase and you have your, your exact do not always bid aggressively on the most expensive keywords. Sometimes you shouldn't be bidding as high. Once you've tested it and it's not, you're like, man, this I'm making revenue, but I'm not making profits. You drop your bid to what the actual CPC is, the cost per click. So let's just say you're bidding 212, but the actual cost per click for you is $2. Drop it to $2. It'll actually save you money. Second, it's okay to be more aggressive with medium cost keywords that don't rank as much, but they're more targeted than more expensive keywords that are shorter, which means they're more broad. See what I mean? Let me put it this way. If you had the choice between having your product shared on Pinterest to a relevant audience versus getting it presented on the Today's Show, which would you pick? Almost everyone picks Today's Show. The problem with that is today's show covers a wide genre of people. It's not targeted. Many authors have tried both business businesses, product businesses, and Pinterest has beaten almost every time when the audience was targeted. It's better that 100 people see a very relevant keyword, which usually means it's long tail, than 1,000 people see a less relevant keyword. You might get sales, but it eats up your profits. Next question. Oh, I got it. What's up, Mary? Good to see you. What's up, Ali? Oscar Fernando from Toronto. All right. Okay. Next question is, what's with the different marketplaces you can sell in like different countries? I'm assuming you're referring to Amazon, my friend. Well, Amazon won't stop. <laughs> That's the answer. 
Uh, there's so many places now you can sell. It's insane. For a while now, you've been able to sell in United Arab Emirates. Um, it's moving into new – Brazil opened up. Like it's just – there's a ton. The last I checked, there were 19 countries. I can't tell you off the top of my head how many there are, but there's a lot. What I would do is start on .com. Yes, the competition is higher, but you will make more money quicker, more quickly if you differentiate your product and target your PPC back to what Coley asked. Then expand to other marketplaces. That's what we always recommend. If you guys go to jod.com slash freedom, jod.com slash freedom, you can find more information there on our training, which is, I mean, I would challenge anyone to, out of, I know it might sound a little arrogant, but to tell me they have a better training than just one time. Like we were so freaking in depth, you guys. You'd be like every single lesson we do, there are steps after the lesson. Here's what to do next. Before you move on to the next lesson, there's quizzes, there's live coaching, there's an amazing community. We send you product ideas. We have staff in China who will sign you up with suppliers or they'll get you supplier contact information uniquely for your product. Like it's, it's badass. Okay, let's keep going. Next question is, Oh man, they told me I can only do two more questions. Uh, tips on building a strong relationship with suppliers. Great question. Get on WeChat. WeChat is more difficult to get on today than it was a year ago because now you need someone else who's on WeChat to verify you're okay. So ask your supplier, hey, I'm gonna open a WeChat account. I need you to verify something for me. Once they verify you're legit, you open up WeChat, now you're gonna build a better relationship. Take time to build a relationship. Don't just talk to them from a business perspective. Get to know them as people. They don't need to be your best friend. But you need to build something beyond just we do business. When you do that, you build trust. Don't be surprised when you see some of your products being moved to the front of the assembly line, even though other people were there first just because of the relationship. All right, next question. What's up, Akio? What do you think is more effective, PPC and Amazon or a proper influencer marketing campaign? PPC and Amazon as a general rule. I'm sure there's exceptions to it. Here's the thing. With an influencer campaign, that's like getting a shot right? Like boom, all of a sudden you get a bunch of sales. But to think that getting the right influencer at the right time, the perfect person is just going to last forever. No, it's a spike. It's not a long-term plan. It can help. The way marketing has changed today compared to even just three or four years ago is it's spread out. You need to have a lot of little fires going at the same time versus just, I need one big, amazing interview with this company or perfect influencer has a billion followers. In fact, the best influencers have between like 20 and 40,000 followers. Why? Because they have a targeted audience. They're not buying followers, so they're real followers and they will work with you. They're not so busy that they can't take time to make some kind of deal. But PPC, every time I would go over an influencer if I had to pick between the two, because with PPC, I can target perfectly. Yes, you can target with an influencer, but you have less control. You don't have the same amount of data. I don't know how well a product is doing based on an influencer. I do based on PPC. Great question. What's up, Maria? Hey, Seth, I'm from Canada and I want to start selling an Amazon. What do you recommend and advise me as a beginner? Start on amazon.com. We love you Canadians, but Americans like to buy things. So start here. That's where the money's going to be. Uh, still going strong. But for not for new entrepreneurs, Chinese merchants are taking full control. Um, I'm going to be blunt. If you believe that, then that will become your self-fulfilled prophecy. If you believe they're controlling your success, if you believe it's their fault that you're struggling, then you're not going to get anywhere. What you have to say is, yeah, this is a problem. I agree with you, brother or sister. I agree. Th there is a problem there. But no, they're not taking full control. Because if that was true, then we wouldn't be making money in Amazon today. You wouldn't be able to go to Amazon and buy stuff. The question is, are you going to let that make you stronger or are you going to let that make you a victim? Next question, Steve Carroll. I am now restricted to more items categories than when I started three years ago. How to become ungated in more areas, items, no negative reviews, comments, complaints. Gotcha. This is because Amazon's policies change. They're not static. Second, have you been selling in all those categories? If you stop selling in a category for a certain number of days, the going number is 90, but that's kind of off the street. That's not proven. I've seen it in more or less. You might be closed off from a category that you were ungated in. The best way to do this is start in a category that does not need ungating and sell like crazy. Then request to be open in other categories. All right. I know, I know, guys, I need to stop, but I have to get to Steve's question because Steve, your question just popped up to the top and now I can't see it. Oh man, you guys have so many questions. Yes, guys, the the interview with Renee Christine, it's been recorded. 
it will be posted very soon. We've been so focused on done for you and our investors. It's like, we're like super laser focused right now. That's partly why I haven't been on YouTube for a while. I've been like almost non-existent on Instagram, but we are live, we are healthy, we are here, and we want to keep serving you guys the best way we can. One of the most encouraging things to me is when someone sends me an email and says, Seth, I just fired my boss. Seth, I now can travel wherever I want in the world. I just got this, is my phone over there? Um, I just got a, a text on WhatsApp. I would show it to you right now if I could. 1.3 million. Let me. Show, I don't know if this is going to focus or not, but I just want you to know I don't just pull this stuff out of thin air, okay? Please check this out, guys. Again, I don't know if you're going to see it or not, but I'm going to try, okay? Here we go. Check this out. So you see I'm on WhatsApp. Ready? I'm going to click. Can you see that, guys? 1.3 million. That's one of my students. One of Just When I'm students. Go to another one. I'm just telling you, and this is on WhatsApp, okay? Like we get this stuff all the time. Why? Because we're gonna teach you how to build a business the right way. And we're not gonna fluff it up and make it look easier than it is. It is hard. Everyone, everyone's been hit by the logistics. Everyone, you're not alone. For those of you guys who feel like you're on an island, you are not alone. Don't tell me you're gonna let a pandemic cause you to give up on your dreams. Let's go, guys. Like this is where we get strong. Have you ever respected anyone who just gave up when it got tough? No. This is the time where we're like, okay, it's time to flex. Let's hit it harder. Let's grow. Let's get stronger. Let's increase our patience. We can do this. And it's not going to be easy. And I kind of like that. <laughs> like, seriously, like my wife thinks I'm a little insane, but I like problems. Let's run headfirst into the problem and say, is that all you got? That ain't so bad. And this doesn't just apply to your business. It applies to everything, relationships, how you manage your finances, your own children, your health. Life is not easy, but only you can make a decision for your future. No one else can make it for you. The only question is, do you believe? Guys, I'm sorry I can't get all these questions. We had to give primary focus priority to the people who asked online. But here's what we are going to do. I'm going to ask the team. Um, Jay, EJ, Caleb, decide everyone who I know is on the back end right now, take screenshot these questions. Okay. Screenshot them. And what we're going to do is we're going to answer them on Instagram, but the only way for you to see them is you got to follow just one dime. And by the way, that's how this all started with a single dime. Cheers to everybody. Thank you so much. I wish you an amazing rest of your day and thank you for these awesome questions. Let's go.